uh, Bray disease is a rare disease, and it has uh, non-specific findings um, as the initial presentation. So you might have, for example, GI discomfort, uh, pain in the hands and feet, or other symptoms that are fairly common in the general population. But recognizing the disorder early is actually essential. So for example, um, once you've lost a certain amount of kidney function, that is not reversible. So the goal is to recognize the condition, make the diagnosis before there is irreversible damage done or a loss of function from one of your organs. That um, can be a challenge. So there are a couple of ways to try to get the diagnosis. One of them is I divide Fabry diagnoses into three categories, easy, moderate, and difficult. So the easy ones are people who come in and say, I have a family history of Fabry disease, and then you know to work them up, or if they have some of the more specific findings like angiokeratomas, which are purple spots on the skin, uh, most commonly around the belly button or in the inguinal creases, um, but can be in other parts of the body. Um, corneal whorls, which can be seen on a slit lamp with an eye exam, so would be an ophthalmologic diagnosis. Uh, and if you have those things, then everybody who's at risk by pedigree should be tested, and it's easy to make the diagnosis. Most people don't come in with something like that. Um, the moderate are people who have significant health problems that are highly associated with febrile disease. And that would be people like with things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, early onset proteinuria, um, and uh, possibly things like unexplained lymphedema, especially if it's accompanied by um, neuropathic pain in the hands and feet. And those are findings that are very common in Fabry disease and that are not very common in the general population, but do have other causes. For them, it's reasonable to expect people to think of Fabry disease and test, although I think there is a better way to do that. Um, and the, the hard ones are the people who only have the nonspecific findings, and you want to find out what's driving them, but there are lots of things on the list of possible diagnoses, many of which are more common and therefore more likely than febrile disease. And for those, you just need to think broadly, which for someone like me who specializes in rare diseases is pretty easy. But that's a big challenge for people who um, are, for example, primary care doctors or who uh, are seeing people from the general population for things like heart problems or kidney disease. So I think the most efficient way to make the diagnosis at this point, because our tools have improved somewhat, is instead of having to think of febrile disease and test at that point, we want you to see somebody. So for example, if a cardiologist sees somebody with um, hypertrophy of the left ventricle, if they think, I need to know what's causing this, and they don't have an obvious cause like hypertension or diabetes, then they say, well, there's a good chance that this is genetic and testing broadly for all of the genetic causes that would include febrile disease, but would also potentially identify other disorders. Um, and it could pick up people who have two things that are driving those findings. And you could have that kind of an approach for heart disease, kidney disease, lymphedema, uh, acroparesthesias, uh, and even possibly the GI symptoms. Music